this Hopkins lecture series that is being organized. And I see that I am the fourth one in this series. And I also see that some very, very outstanding and eminent professors of English have been invited earlier. Manu, Etienne, Cherian, all these have been my friends for the last 30 years. And therefore, my the, the feeling that I am very privileged is doubled because St. Joseph's Evening College has somehow seen it fit to put me in that league. These are extremely well-known uh, professors of English. So to put me in that league, uh, I think I must thank St. Joseph's for this. So I'd like to thank St. Joseph's the management, the principal, the Department of English, and all of you for having uh, invited uh, me to spend a couple of minutes with you. Having said that, my starting point again is or are two things. First, uh, Professor, Chiri, uh, Professor uh, Jirin sent me a video link of uh, Dr. Cherin Alexander's uh, talk, the previous one, the third one I think it was. That is my starting point and another starting point is the concluding remarks that uh, Professor Divakar made a couple of minutes ago. To take the second one first, you see, it is in the nature of academics to compartmentalize. It's in the nature of academics to fragmentize. As for example, we have sociology, we have political science, we have history. Academics treats these as very, very watertight compartments. But insofar as knowledge itself is concerned, it is not compartmentalized. So such of us who go through school, college, etc., etc., somehow carry that prejudice and somehow feel that history is very different from sociology and sociology is very different from literature, etc., etc. This is one of the compulsions, I might say. I might also say that this is one of the weaknesses of academics. But unfortunately, it is also inevitable for academics to do this. It has to compartmentalize. One second, academics also has to theorize. When I say theorize, the focus here is on theorizing anything and everything. Well, sometimes it is possible that people might, uh, people outside the academics especially, might find a fault with academicians. They are of the opinion that academicians theorize everything and there is no practical element in academics. So they would like to say that sitting in an accountancy class for three years, you learn nothing. But if you go out work somewhere for two years, you get to know more accounting knowledge. I'm just giving one example. So there is always this uh, problem with academics that we have to theorize. But I would also like to tell you here in defense of academics that if there is a practice, there must be a theory behind it. It is another matter that we might not know what the theory is. But if there is a practice, there must be a theory behind it. Otherwise, you cannot have a practice. So it is not the chicken and egg story, which came first. It's not as complicated as that. It's simpler here. If you have a practice, you must have a theory. So there can be no practice without theory. But you can have several theories without practice. So this is also a problem with academics, that it has to theorize. And therefore, sometimes it receives a lot of criticism from non-academicians. However, uh, the point that I was trying to arrive at uh, in referring to 
uh, Professor Divakar's concluding remarks that this fragmentation, this compartmentalization, that also is a part of what I want to speak today. That's why I said my take of point are these two. Now coming to Professor Cherian's lecture that was delivered uh, as number three in the series, some of you who may have attended probably must have felt I think his topic was something like this, uh, the dissenting muse, if I am not mistaken, something like say dissenting muse. Muse traditionally in western uh, mythology is supposed to be uh, in our terms, god of inspiration, god of arts. So what is this dissenting muse? And I think he spoke, I uh, listened to his uh, talk, his lecture on the YouTube, much of what he said was how writers respond, how literature responds to crisis in their respective ages, in their respective periods. In other words, when regimes, when governments become dictatorial, authoritarian and totalitarian, how does literature respond to this? Now this is again my second takeoff point. To begin with, what is it that has happened to literature? That someone like Charyan, who I know for the last 30 years, is steeped in literature, but does not seem to be directly talking about Shelley or Keats or Shakespeare. It's not that he did not speak, he spoke. But he spoke in a way that's very, very different from what generally people expect from uh, literature professors. Why does that happen? That, in fact, is what I thought I would speak about here. That's the reason why when uh, I was asked by Professor uh, Jerin as well as Professor Divakar, what, what I would like to speak on, I gave them this topic, from literary studies to cultural studies. This is the topic that uh, I gave them and this is what I'd like to speak to you about. Uh, something like, something that happened about seven, eight months ago also was one reason why this was there at the back of my mind. Two incidents in fact. About seven, eight months ago, one of my PhD students was defending the thesis. This was on women characters in mythology and how these women characters were revisited by contemporary writers. Characters like Sita, Draupadi, etc, etc. And how she looked at them was very, very different in the sense that how Generally, mm, uh, these characters are looked at, they looked at as, say, gods, demigods, etc., etc. But that's not how she looked at them. She looked at them as human beings, you and me. And what enabled her to do this? What enabled her to do this is the application of feminist literary theories, Indian feminist literary theories. And that's the reason why I began with saying something about theory. After she defended her thesis and was declared eligible to the doctoral degree, one of those who was sitting in the auditorium later after the defense was over when we were having tea, he came up to me and asked because she happened to be my student and I was supervising a thesis, he came up to and asked me. He was around 80 and he introduced himself and he said he had been a professor of English and then also a vice chancellor of one of the universities in uh, northern India. He came and told me, what is it that you people have done to literature? You have destroyed literature. That is what he told me. Well, I tried to answer, but somehow he didn't seem to be convinced. 
this was about seven, eight months ago. And in the previous semester that I was teaching my students, I was teaching this course called Cultural Studies. One of my students had this in the first introductory class, after I had given them an introduction to Cultural Studies, this student got up and asked, what, whatever you said for one hour, what has that got to do with literature? Because for that one hour, I hardly spoke about any writer, literature, poet, or poetry, or fiction. Some of the words that we are, uh, we expect to hear in a literature class. These two set me thinking, and that was the reason why I thought I would uh, give this as a topic. Very briefly, you see, what is it that has happened to literary studies? Why is it that old timers find it difficult, like the professor that I spoke to, uh, who spoke to me, and who was very, very angry with what people like us had done to literature? And he said, like I told you, he was very, very upset. He said, you've destroyed literature. Now, why do people think that literature has been destroyed? This has something to do with what has happened to literary texts or how today discussions on literary texts take place. We have to go back to 1860s, 1870s. Now what I thought I would do was just briefly trace how literary studies got morphed into cultural studies. How and why people like Cherian can talk the way they do. This, in short, is what I will address today. To begin with, a lot of things were happening in the second half of uh, 19th century in England. Now, once again, why England? If we are talking about literature, English literature, etc., etc., there is no other place to start with other than going back to England. However, post-colonial, we might be in our thinking. It might, for instance, be very easy to point out that this guy is going back to England and he suffers from a colonial hangover. I am aware. I am aware of post-colonial theory. But still, in spite of this, the starting point for anything like what I intend to do is going back to England. <coughs> In 1860s, certain things started happening in England as a result of Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution had peaked by then. Incidentally, of course, our romantic poets, Wordsworth, Shelley, Keats, etc., their love for nature also stems from here, from what was happening in England till about 100-150 years before that, that is somewhere around 1700-1720, uh, around about this. England was largely an agrarian country. Industrial, industrial revolution changed it all. It transformed an agricultural country into an industrial country or industrial society. And this had ravaged the English countryside. One of the earliest expressions of this is Oliver Goldsmith's The Deserted Village. I think he wrote that in 1770. And then that trend continued and our romantics in the first uh, half of 19th century picked it up. However, that's not the point that I thought I would stress on. But anyway, this is what the Industrial Revolution did insofar as uh, our poetry is concerned, literature is concerned. It gave rise to poets like the Romantic poets, the British Romantics, the famed British Romantics. But it also created a kind of shift in demand for employment. You see, agriculture largely is a profession where you have a son accompanying the father into the fields 
and learning what to do at what time. When do you harvest? When do you plow the land? When do you till the land? Etc. Etc. So these are not, of course, these days we have agricultural universities for this. But this was largely learned as something like, say, a family trade. But as industrial revolution took a very strong grip on England, why England in particular? You might remember that England is a part of Europe. And generally what happens in one corner of Europe, Europe, as you know, is a continent that has countries very tightly packed. So you could start from one country in the morning and by evening you could have passed through four or five countries. That's how tightly packed Europe is with countries. So one, something that starts in one corner of Europe generally finds uh, it itself transported to another uh, place in another country in England in a matter of 10, 15, 20 years. That is how we get this Renaissance. Renaissance started, as you know, in Italy and then moved on to other parts of Europe, including England. And we talk about Christopher Marlowe. We talk about Shakespeare as Renaissance writers. And then this Romanticism it began in Germany and then spilled over to other parts of Europe. And uh, the result in England, insofar as England is concerned, is Wordsworth, Coleridge, Byron, these writers. From France, we get symbolism, imagism. We talk about Eliot, we talk about Ezra Pound. These are all very, very well known imagist and symbolist poets. And the influence, insofar as England is concerned, comes now again from France. So if you take a look at what happens in Europe, you will see most countries in Europe, apart from England that is, have been associated with the origin of some literary, artistic or cultural movement. Like I said, Renaissance, symbolism, romanticism etc etc England interestingly has not given rise to one single cultural or artistic movement probably this is why Napoleon who had a long standing feud with England France has always had a problem with England and England has always had a problem with France right from 1066 Anglo Norman conquest uh, Napoleon, it appears, <coughs> is supposed to have said, what do the English know about culture? They are a nation of shopkeepers. So, England has never been associated with the origin of any cultural movement. Interestingly, the only thing that originated in England is Industrial Revolution. Once again, probably, uh, Napoleon, Napoleon was right. The only thing that originated in England, that is worthy of note, is Industrial Revolution. So in England, when Industrial Re Revolution broke out, it changed a lot of equations. Now it demanded labor who were literate, because machines were being used. And machines have dials, machines have switches. You have to switch on something, change the dial, etc etc they may be very very simple but you have to have some kind of a literacy to this you have to know which one is on which one is off today it might look very simple to you and me we are talking about the time when industrial revolution broke out when machines were introduced for the first time to manufacture and to produce goods i'm taking you back to that time so some kind of uh, skills associated with schools, colleges, was needed. So what England did was, beginning from 1860 through 1899, there were three or four educational reforms in England. The last educational reform in England 
was at the time of Victoria's ascension to the throne of England around about 1834. And from 1834 to 1860, there is hardly any one thinking about education or reforming education. And suddenly, there are four reforms that come, four major reforms in almost 35, 40 years time. Something that has never, had never happened in England before. As a result, what happened was that uh, you see, some of the reforms specified that parents had to compulsorily put their children in schools. And if parents failed to do that, they could be imprisoned. Some of the reforms were so very severe. So, by 1899-1900s, we see people who are educated in the sense that they could read and write. But they could not read a Shakespearean play, read in the sense, read and understand. That's what I mean. Or Jane Austen or George Eliot. They could not read and understand. But then they could read and write. Because they were educated specifically not to engage with complex literary texts, but to perform very, very simple tasks. Therefore, they succeeded, England succeeded in creating a group of people. Why a group of people? Majority of them, youngsters, in 30, 40 years, who could read and write. Now, any given person who can read and write, his or her first instinct is to pick up anything that's there lying around and read. Look at what we ourselves do when we are waiting for someone in a hotel or in the lobby of a hotel or somewhere, we just look around and if there is something that we can read, the first thing that we do is take and read that, even if it is three days old newspaper. That is our instinct, that becomes an instinct. Not that we love reading, but somewhere or the other, that is our instinct. For instance, if something is packed to us when we go to a shop, something is packed to us, a newspaper and given to us, about 40-50% of us at least, after taking out whatever has been packed in the newspaper, wrapped in the newspaper, may very casually take a look at what's there in the newspaper, that piece of paper. Not that we are very, very interested. Well, that is our instinct, that becomes our instinct. So therefore, these people who are what shall we say, products of these educational reforms that was taking place, that were taking place or had taken place in England, they were now able to read and write. But since they had not attended schools or colleges, they were not able to engage with these great literary texts. So what do you do? Which is the reason why, if you take a look at the history of publication of journals, magazines, there is a spurt during this period. <coughs> now, hundreds of journals, hundreds of periodicals, hundreds of magazines that mushroomed. And obviously the one who benefited from this was none other than author Conan Doyle. And Sherlock Holmes became a household figure because of this. Well, if this was what was happening insofar as the literary scene was concerned, what was happening insofar as the critical scene was concerned, which is what we are more concerned with. I said, why is it that literature professors or people engaged in literary studies, why is it that they talk the way they do? That was the question that I put to myself. So then, what was happening here? In the early 2000s, the 21st century. For the first time, there is a change that comes over in literary criticism. Once again, let's trace the history of literary criticism. We begin with 17th century, then we go to 18th century, we have people like Alexander Poet, Dryden, and then we come to the Romantics, 
Wordsworth wrote William, uh, sorry, uh, lyrical ballads. Coleridge wrote Biographia Literaria. Shelley wrote Defense of Poetry. And Keats, though he did not write any formal criticism in his letters to various people that he wrote, his brothers, etc., that in itself has come to be seen as very important contribution to literary criticism. It is in one of the letters to his brothers that he uses the term negative capability. Some of you may have come across this term. This is a very, very important term in literary criticism. And then a little later, we have the Victorians, Matthew Arnold. So you see, all these poets, all these, these critics who spoke about literature, who had spoken about literature in the last 400 years, leading up to early 20, uh, 20th century. You can see that the one thing common, all of them were writers themselves. They were what may be called as writers or poets first and then critics. Right? Alexander Pope, who wrote an essay on criticism, which is not in prose but in poetry, but still is criticism. Literary, it's accepted as literary criticism. And then uh, these romantic poets. And then Matthew Arnold. All these were practicing poets. So it was as if literary criticism or criticism of literature was something that was engaged in by practicing writers. But this undergoes a change in early 20th century. So therefore, the kind of criticism that we get when we read Biographia Literaria, preface to lyrical ballads, defense of poetry, etc., etc., are all developed from the point of view of writers. So they are talking about diction. That is why, that, that's why uh, Wordsworth says, uh, poetry must be, uh, must use the language of a common man. So he is basically talking as a poet. So literary criticism, since it was practiced by writers themselves, basically addressed the questions of diction and then the role of a poet, which is what Shelley does in uh, Defense of Poetry, as well as talking about imagination, reason, etc., etc., but when we come to the first part of 20th century, like I said, things change. One, you see, the appearance of journals, etc., etc. That is one, one development. Another development was here in the sphere of literary criticism. The first time we see professional critics engaged in the act of literary criticism. So we have someone like F.R. Lewis, I.A. Richards. These people became extremely influential. So very influential that, especially F.R. Lewis, so very influential that it was not till beginning from 1920 till 1940, 1960 almost, they dominated the cultural and the literary scene in not only England, but in Europe. And what is it that they did? What they did was, they were appalled by the appearance of another parallel culture. That is, another parallel literary culture that was inaugurated by these popular magazines. They termed this as mass culture. So in the 1920s, 1930s, there is a great debate that takes place in England in academic departments, especially in literary uh, literature departments. And these people were made very extremely derogatory statements about these mass, about mass culture. If W. B. Yeats is writing this poem, Second Coming, and write this line. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed. Generally, these lines are not interpreted in the way I am interpreting. Why is it that the center is falling apart? Why is it that there is anarchy? Now, 
because it has been interpreted in different ways. Generally, the general interpretation for these lines is that this was WB Yeats' comment on the state of affairs in Europe round about the two world wars. That's how it's generally interpreted. But there is also another interpretation possible. And this interpretation is this, that the kind of privileged place that literature had been given the canon had been given. It was also the time when the canon was established. A canon is nothing but as literature students will know, is a list of great English writers. So this was also the time when that canon was established. The practice of canon making was established. So what he is trying to say is this, that no longer is literature so very privileged. No longer is literature so very holy. Mass culture seems to have contaminated the purity of what is called as high art. The term high bro and low bro that we use today. A high bro is an intellectual. A low bro is a non-intellectual like you and me. It was also coined during this time and the person who coined the term high bro and low bro is F.R. Lewis. He also started a magazine, a journal called Scrutiny, which was an extremely influential journal for, and it ran for almost 30-35 years. And their sole objective was to develop such methods or critical methods that would distinguish <coughs> literature from non-literature. So then, this is once again another important development that takes place in the first half of 20th century. So literature somehow seemed to have or been imparted with some kind of values. It would mean in other words, it was value loaded. It was assumed that it would be possible for us to find a great writer and great writing by making use of certain critical protocols, using certain critical tools. And what were the critical tools that were developed? You have dissociation of sensibility. You have words like paradox, irony, becoming critical idioms. So this was, and also go back to what Matthew Arnold himself started in 1870s, 1880s when he wrote Culture and Anarchy 1, Second Study of Poetry. Matthew Arnold, as you all know, at least most literature students will know, designed a particular tool called the Touchstone Method. The Touchstone Method is a method in which Matthew Arnold gives us examples of some great poems. So if you have to know, if you come across a poem or a poet, and if you have to know whether his poetry or he's a great poet, all that you have to do is take lines from this poet, compare it with or put it along with certain great writers that great lines that he himself gives as examples of great poetry. You compare. And when you compare, you will find out whether this, the poet line that you have with you, whether that matches in tone, in intensity, in felicity, etc. The lines, or rather the poems that he himself prescribes as the standard. So that becomes what is called as the touchstone method. A little later, our Eliot carries this forward. For him, comparison is an extremely important tool of evaluation. He writes this in one of his essays. What it means, in other words, is these people were designing tools, reading protocols to help people 
distinguish between literature and non-literature. <coughs> it became very, very important for them because, like I was telling you, there was a parallel literary culture that was developing in England. And this literary culture that was developing had such great mass following that we term this as mass literature or mass culture. This was engulfing the elite literature. So it became very important for these people, Matthew Arnold and uh, the 20th century, early 20th century critics, Lewis, Eliot, etc., etc., to provide means, uh, me, uh, means by which it would be possible for them to distinguish, make a distinction between literature and non-literature. So literature became loaded with certain values. And literature became very, very privileged. So if I were to ask you this question, can yesterday's newspaper become literature? What would you say? What would you say? <coughs> would, if I consider or call yesterday's newspaper literature, would you go with me or would you say, I am destroying the notion of literature? What would you say? Why do you say that? Ask. We have to ask ourselves this question. If we feel that yesterday's newspaper cannot qualify as literature, why do we say that? Obviously in our mind, we associate whatever we call as literature with certain values. Something that Eagleton in 1982, writing the introduction to his introduction to literary theory comes down very heavily on. Now what is this value? Why is it that I am unwilling, I am very hesitant to call yesterday's newspaper literature? That is primarily because, you see, we still suffer from the effects of these critics, Lewis, Eliot, etc. We su still suffer from the kind of criticism and their ideas on what constitutes literature. So literature must be about something which is great. But if I ask you, yesterday's newspaper is also talking about something which is great, something is, which is great insofar as yesterday, today, our contemporary times are concerned. So then what's our problem in accepting it? No, it has to be universal. For instance, how does Johnson begin to face to Shakespeare? Shakespeare is for all time. In other words, what he was trying to say was cutting across time barriers. Whether you live in 19th century, 17th century or 20th century or 21st century. Cutting across geographical barriers. That is whether you live in India or England or Africa, no matter where. Shakespeare is for all time, he said. So, in other words, these people were arriving at certain values that they found in literature or were promoting. And that was this universality. Somehow, these people were trying to pass the idea that, promote the idea that literature had a timeless quality. Literature was universal in the sense that if Shakespeare is great, he might be all right. Greatness, insofar as Shakespeare is concerned, and if it is accepted in England, it's perfectly all right. But their insistence was that he was great insofar as an Indian reader also was concerned, insofar as an African reader was also concerned. But when I look at Tempest, that's not what I feel. When I look at Merchant of Venice, when a Jew reads Merchant of Venice, he sees no greatness in Shakespeare. He sees no great, no greatness in Shakespeare. You see, one of the problems that the Scots, people in Scotland, which is Northern Britain, have with the English writers, specifically Shakespeare is Macbeth. How Macbeth is portrayed by Shakespeare is very, very far away from 
what the real Macbeth was. So even today, Scots, Scotsmen have not forgiven Shakespeare for what he did to Macbeth, Macbeth's character. He converted Macbeth into a bloodthirsty villain. Some of you may have read Macbeth. So that's not what real Macbeth was. So what I'm trying to say is, please notice, their insistence on the universality, the timelessness, etc. was in itself very, very artificial. In other words, it was some kind of an imperialism of another kind. It was as if the British culture was being imposed on the rest of the world. So how was I to read Tempest? I am the Caliban that Shakespeare is talking about. <coughs> Colonized people are Calibans. Are we to say we were savages, we are savages? That is what Shakespeare says <coughs> in Tempest. Am I to say I am uncultured? Am I to say that, am I to accept the fact that the, before the British came and colonized countries like India and Africa, <coughs> that people here were savages? You will be surprised. Even today, in parts of America, quite a few people still think India is a country of snake charmers. I understand that I am talking to you on 6th or 7th July 2018. I can still tell you this. So, how do we read Tempest? From what these people were telling, that is the critics in the early 20th century, what from what they were saying, we had to read them, read Shakespeare, that's Tempest for example, in much the same way as an Englishman would read. So the Prospero is the white man there and Caliban is the colored the colonized. How am I to read? Am I am supposed to read it not from Caliban's point of view, but from Prosperous point of view, which you and I are not. You are not white, I am not white. So why should we read? You see, these questions were asked after 1960s. This consciousness in engaging with literary text and what they meant came after 1960s. So this is what was happening in the early, the first half of 20th century in England. So somehow, somewhere or the other, whatever was called literature was privileged. And why were critics necessary? Critics were necessary from the point of view of these people, Eliot, Lewis, etc., etc. They were required because a common man who might be able to read and write may not have the tool to distinguish between literature and non-literature. This is also the, the Roman Catholic idea which was put in practice in literature or literary studies that a common man cannot communicate with God directly. We need a mediator. So, between the writer works and his works and the reader, there can be no direct communion or communication. We need a mediator. And the mediator was the critic. So, you can see how literature and the practice of literary criticism was privileged. But over a period of time, in another 30, 40 years, a lot of things started happening. We also know that the middle of 20th century is the age of democracy. If you take a look at those countries that got their independence, most of the countries that have been colonized got independence around about this time, 1940s, 1950s onwards. And one of the last countries that got independent was Kenya, I think. 
Nigeria, Guinea, one of these countries in 1960. So between 1940 and 1960, we see that ideas of democracy, self-governance, self-determination, political self-determination become very, very prominent in the world, in the development of ideas. This is something that we see happening to literature also, the act of reading. Therefore, Roland Barthes writes this essay, some of you may have read this, the very, very iconic essay that he writes in 1950s. This is called The Death of the Author. And what does he say there? He says, if the reader is to be born, it is necessary for the author to be dead. <coughs> but what did he mean? Did he mean literally that the reader had to kill the writer? That's not what he meant in literary terms. What he meant was, as long as you allow an author to control the meaning, the author becomes authoritarian and a dictator. So therefore, the reader had to actively produce meaning. This is also something that our later reader response theorists picked it up. So who controls the meaning in a literary text? When I, when I read a Shakespeare play, who should be controlling the meaning? Who should be producing the meaning? Should I allow the author to produce the meaning or should I, as an active consumer, produce the meaning? You see, democratic process would require that it is the reader, the consumer, who produces the meaning and not the writer, not the author. Right? So you can also see certain changes that were taking place in political spheres, in the thinking of people like democracy, etc., that crept into the act of reading texts. So as long as you hold something great, universal, etc., etc., you are only imposing, you are making the writer greater than what he actually is. In other words, you are making a god out of a writer. Whereas a writer is a human being, is how later critics after 1960s looked at texts. In the 1960s, another interesting thing happened. Semiotics as an academic discipline started emerging. This, the emergence of semiotics changed the notion of a text, literature, that is the printed text, which had been privileged till 1950s, 1960s, now began to lose ground. And for the first time, a new kind of an idea crept in. And that creeps in because most of the critics who come round about 1960s, are not people who come from literature background. They come from different uh, disciplines, academic disciplines, that is sociology, philosophy, history. And therefore, what they impart is something that is not, so to say, contaminated with literature, which had been the case earlier. And uh, as semiotics rises, semiotics is a study of science, S-I-G-N-S, S-C-I-E-N-C, -E that science, the science, study of science. The slim book that Roland Barthes wrote in 1955-56 is called Mythology. And here, for the first time, he analyzed, believe it or not, advertisements, advertisements of detergents, the new model, the shape of the new model of a car, and so on and so forth, which means he took things that were available in the public arena, 
in what may be called as mass culture. He took them and analyzed. And how he went about analyzing, clearly he was applying certain theories. By then we have what may be called as the structuralist and the post-structuralist theories. Then deconstruction. In a minute I'll tell you what deconstruction is. Not, I will not take too much time. Just one or two sentences about what deconstruction means and how it impacted literary studies. Deconstruction simply meant this deconstruction of any privileged reading. Deconstruction simply means this, that no one reading or no one way of understanding anything must be privileged over other ways of meaning making. That means when I read a literary text, it does not have only one meaning. I may generate one meaning. You may generate another meaning. And there is nothing in this world to say my meaning that I have generated is greater than, must be more important, considered to be more important than the meaning that you have produced. This is deconstruction in one line. That is all. It questions dominant reading practices. So as it did that, please notice, it was also trying to say, this is also what post-structuralism does. Post-structuralism changed the way we look at literary texts. For the simple reason that it gave us one line, it changed our notion of history. <clears throat> what post-structuralism says is this, history of any one country is not just one history. Often, there are multiple histories. They are running parallel at the same time. Some of them may be contradictory. How do we understand this in the Indian context? Most of the times, we hear about the glorious Indian culture, etc., etc. Whose culture is that? That is being called glorious. It is the elite upper class culture. So at the time that there was this glorious Indian culture flourishing in India, <laughs> were there no Dalits? What happens to their history? What happens to their culture? Hardly is there any text that talks about the life of Dalits or the culture of Dalits or the history of Dalits. But can we say that there was no, there were no Dalits at all? What happens to their history? So you see, the history of upper class may run counter to the history of Dalits. What happened during the British rule, the colonial rule? I'm sure you know. The, you must also be aware by now that not all of them wanted, not all Indians, that is, wanted freedom for India, independence for India. Gandhi was a very, very uh, disappointed man toward the end of his life. Even not just toward the end of his life. Something that he sees in as early as 1909 when he writes Hind Swaraj. Something that Nehru also saw that he mentions in Discovery of India. What does the Swaraj mean? Swaraj, of course, means freedom. But what did Gandhi mean when he wrote, when he was talking about Swaraj? in India. He had to clarify that and therefore he wrote Hind Swaraj, which is a slim book. Please do read it. And he said, by Swaraj I mean this, that everyone in India, including the poorest of the poor, when he said poorest of the poor, he was talking about the farmer, becomes free. Because the freedom movement was appropriated and hijacked by the upper classes in India. Clearly what happens is soon after India gets, gets its independence in 1947, there is an exhibition that is organized in Mumbai to commemorate or celebrate this independence that we've got. And this independence, this, this, uh, this exhibition has lot of theme-based 
partitions. So a very eminent leader, I would not like to name, an eminent leader who is associated with independence movement in India is asked to inaugurate. He inaugurates this exhibition and goes around. He comes to that section where there are paintings, there are models, etc., etc., of farmers' participation in the freedom movement. He asks the organizers, what is this doing here? The organizers tell him that this is the freedom, or rather participation of the farmers, etc., in the independence struggle, or their contribution. We are marking, we are commemorating their, we are acknowledging their participation. He says, close this down. It's closed. That means, in other words, please notice, we might talk about independence, but this independence has been made available, or the benefits, the fruits of this independence has been made available only to the upper class. <coughs> A point that Anya Lumba makes in colonial, uh, colonialism slash post-colonialism, if you read that essay, if you read that book. point that Mahashweta Devi makes in her Draupadi, for example, her short story Draupadi, Draupadi for example. In other words, what I'm trying to say is, literature and the reading protocols that was developed in early 20th century led to the creation of elitism, feelings of elitism. This is what was destroyed in 1960s. And the rise of semiotics changed the notion of a text. No longer was a text, a literary text, a written text, because for the first time, a new kind of an idea emerged that literature is one of the ways in which a culture communicates. There are several. So an advertisement is also a text. A movie is also a text. This arrangement is also a text. Architecture is a text. So you see the the kind of privilege that was accorded to literature underwent the change. So therefore, literature is one of those cultural markers. Once this idea gained prominence, the reading protocols that had been promoted or devised in the early 20th century, they took a back seat. They began to say that literature is a part of culture. If literature is a part of culture, then through literature it is possible for us to understand the culture of any given people. So, what happened was how we began to read literature underwent a change. So then, that was when there was a crisis in English departments in the 1960s, 70s in England. Quite a lot of English departments almost closed down. They were not English departments, departments of English. They became departments of cultural studies. So literature, literary studies got merged with cultural studies. This was also what was happening in the field of humanities at that point of time. Like I said, you see, these are academized. So we have history treated very differently and separately from sociology. Sociology is treated very, very differently and separately from political science. But here, after 1960s, 70s, when literature departments became merged with humanities, it was also, you see, the na that's also the nature of cultural studies. Some of you who may have studied cultural studies may know this. Cultural studies is multidisciplinary, which means it is not just literature protocols, reading literary protocols that you apply to any text. You also get inputs from sociology. You get inputs from history. If we were not to get inputs from sociology, 
where would feminist literary criticism be? Where would Marxist literary criticism be if you were not to get input from economics? If you were not to get any inputs from history, where would our post-colonial theories be? So please notice that how we look at literary texts undergoes a change. No longer is literature privileged. Literature becomes a part of cultural articulation. How does a culture communicate? It communicates through its art. Right. Therefore, literature is only one of them. And, as I was telling you, the rise of mass culture. See, critics like two very, very important critics in Britain. Raymond Williams and Richard Hobart. In the 1950s, these people came from working class backgrounds. In fact, Raymond Williams was a professor of English. Both of them were professors of English in very leading British universities. And both of them more or less were students of F.R. Lewis. And when F.R. Lewis prescribed courses, such syllabus, these people who came from working class background simply were not able to relate to the texts that were being discussed. It was as if they were not addressed at all. They came from working class background. Something that we get to see our Dalit writers also talking about. <coughs> Ambedkar, for example, and several others, Devnur Mahadeva, for example. Most of these Dalit writers also have the same opinion when they sit in these classes, the classes which syllabus has been prepared. They simply say it does not address our concern at all. It is as if we have been neglected or we have been reduced to invisibility. It is not, it is not as if our presence has even been acknowledged as if we have never existed. Something like that was what was happening in literature departments. And Raymond Williams and Richard Hogart, both of them wrote very extensively and began to consider, or rather, began to promote the idea that popular culture was worthy of study, which is why Raymond Williams makes the statement, culture is ordinary. This is directly in contrast with the idea of culture that was promoted by Matthew Arnold in Culture and Anarchy. Culture is what, from Matthew Arnold's point of view, tending towards sweetness and light. And what did tending towards sweetness and light meant? It meant knowing the best that was produced, written. So that means, in other words, they were creating or promoting a specific idea of culture, which was countered in the 1960s. And as it was countered in the 1960s, literary studies morphed into cultural studies. So therefore, we have cultural studies as a course in MA English, parts of that even in our optional English syllabus. Some of you who may have done your optional English from Bangalore University, may have come across this essay on Lagan. If you've done your BA optional English from Bangalore University, any of the colleges affiliated to Bangalore University, you may have come across this essay on Lagan. What is that doing there? Lagan is from popular culture. Why is that to be discussed? And that occurs along with Shakespeare, the same text, leading writers. So you see, today, Literature is not as privileged as it used to be. So how we read Merchant of Venice has undergone a change. How we read Othello has undergone a change. This is not to say that Shakespeare is not a great writer. <coughs> we simply find new ways or a new reason to say Shakespeare is a great writer. This is not to say Shakespeare is not a great writer, but we have found a new reason. The old reasons do not work anymore you find new reasons to say why Shakespeare is still a great writer. That's all that I have to say. Thank you.